If you would like to support the channel, then please turn off adblock and refresh the page. Alternatively, use the link in the description below to donate to T1 Patreon. Thank you. Hello Magic Community on YouTube, I'm T1 Glistener Elf. Fun fact before we begin, did you know that they had Glistener Elves on Kaladesh? Yeah, I wish that I had used this as a face reveal idea at some point. You've only seen my face about a hundred times though. I have a mono black deck tech for you. Now I'm sure that a lot of you have seen the Emerge decks that have been running around in Standard ever since Eldritch Moon released the eponymous mechanic. Well, this mono black list is of course a budget version, because those are usually teamer, team urge, very nice, a rug colored or blue green or whatever the case may be, salt eye in some cases. This one will save us a good bit of money by not affording all of those lands. Which, if you're a player like me who either can't afford standard or doesn't want to invest in a rotating format, that's certainly a positive trait. But also, having just one color makes us consistent, or a little bit more consistent. And I think that Mono Black has enough answers that it's viable at a at least somewhat competitive level, like FNM, or hopefully a little bit better than that. Hopefully. So let's get started. Now, there are only two emerge creatures, two emerge Eldrazi, that only feature black mana in their emerge cost. One of them, certainly the more powerful of the two, is Distended Mindbender. Before we even get to however many creatures this will take out in combat, it's a two for two. You sacrifice the creature and then this card itself, but you get to take two of their cards from their hand. They reveal the hand and you take one with CMC three or less and another with CMC four or greater. If that sounds awesome, that's because it is. Now a lot of the list have been playing other ones in place of this. Makes sense, to be sure. If you're running uh, Elder Deep Fiend, that's arguably more powerful. It's a 5-6, so it's bigger. Tapping down for permanence, it has flash. It's arguably the better card. But this one, hand attack is good against pretty much everything. Certainly everything in this standard environment because it gives you an answer to everything mainboard and sideboard. So I think that that's a crucial uh, card, it's a crucial, it's consequential, that's a good word for it, right? It deals with everything, but later in the game, not so much. Then again, it is still a 5-5 in the worst case. Now, this one I'm not so crazy about. Same mana cost, same emerge cost. It's a 6-4 instead of a 5-5, and it's slightly easier to cast, but not that having black matters much more than black black, but, and it does Siege Rhine of them, <laughs> the uh, drain bit, or pain and drain, there we go, pain and gain, but it's a 6-4, it dies to Grasp of Darkness. Being 6 might matter, especially against the aforementioned Elder Deep Fiends, but it just doesn't seem as good, it doesn't do quite as much. That being the case, it's still a great card, even if it is a I don't even want to say necessary evil, that makes it sound net negative, just not a card about which I'm crazy. Now, what are we going to actually emerge into these? Well, for one, we have four Pilgrim's Eye. Even though we're just a monocolor deck, so it won't be used for fixing, this does guarantee that you'll have the fourth in order to cast either of them on your fourth turn. Now, since we're mono black, we can't run any ramp really, but very simply, just a 1-1 one, one with flying, that part obviously doesn't really matter. Gets you out of basic land, so it keeps you up on that hand advantage, little deck thinning. And yes, it serves as an emerge target. Now this one is the non-rare about which I was most excited when Kaladesh came out, or was spoiled. It was Filigree Familiar. When it enters the, <laughs> when it enters the battlefield, you gain 2 life. When it dies, you draw a card. So. On the front end, it gains you a little bit of life to keep you alive. On the back end, on the tail end, I guess, dog joke, you draw a card. So that makes either of these that much better. So either way, when they're coming in, you get some sort of advantage from that. And on the way out, you give us a whole card. Now black doesn't tend to do card draw very well. It's usually the kind of mechanic that uh, forces you to hurt yourself or having to discard cards to draw, or something like that, right? Or sacrifice a creature. It's never just straight card draw, or it's rarely straight card draw. However, 
this is something that we can run in black that helps us to refill our hand. If it dies, like say they just remove it naturally, that gets us one card closer to an answer for getting back in the game. If we use it for emerge and then they kill the emerge creature, it still got us one card closer to coming back. Now we do have other win conditions in the deck besides these. I run a one of Kalitas, Trader of Get. If you haven't picked this one up, it will be a modern staple. It is, in fact, showing up as a singleton in Jund and Junk List, and with good reason, right? Survives Lightning Bolt, Lifelink, I don't need to tell you all of that. Oh, it, it does exile their creatures, too. Very nice. Get all that extra value out of kill spells. A little bit better in Jun because Junk has Path to Exile, Obzon has Path to Exile, so they don't need the removal ability quite as much, and they don't get the zombies as readily, but nevertheless, that is obviously a good card, and it sees play in standard as well, for good reason. It gives you mainboard answer, a mainboard answer, against aggro and midrange, but it doesn't tend to do as well against control, and we've seen that before. Now, control may not be very much of a thing, not as much as I was expecting, at least, going into this new standard environment. Cards like Smuggler's Copter do certainly mess with the archetype, but in case it is, I also run a one of Gonti, Lord of Luxury. Now where it doesn't excel in the aggro matches, 2-3 death touch for 4 is definitely not where we need to be. When it enters the battlefield, look at the top 4 cards of target opponent's library, exile one of them face down, then put the rest in the bottom in a random order. As long as that card remains exiled, not as long as you control Gonti. So there are blink shenanigans you can do with this to keep getting cards. But as long as that card remains exiled, you may look at it and cast it, spending mana of any type to cast it. So, obviously that is a great way to get out from under the control decks. You take their threats and answers from them. Uh, yeah, and yeah, if they deal with it, you still got the card. That's fair enough. It dies a little bit more readily, a little more quickly, but no sooner to Grasp of Darkness than Kalitas, usually notwithstanding his ability to pump himself up. Next we run three Liliana the Last Hopes. Now obviously creature removal on a three CMC card, that's pretty good. And the creature removal is the plus, very nice. Even if she can't kill the creature, she can stave them off for a little bit. Also, say that the opponent keeps dealing with your emerge creatures, you can just go and get one back with her middle ability. Mill yourself too, then return a creature from your graveyard to your hand, Seems good, seems very good. And then of course the ult just wins the game. Not immediately, but that's basically what it reads. You win the game. Similarly, we have just a one of Obnixilis Reignited. Part of the reason that he's won is that his CMC is 5 in a deck that only has 23 lands. But again, black card draw, you lose one life to draw a card on his plus. Destroys a creature, unconditionally, so a little bit better than Lily on that front, but it is a minus. And another win condition that says, well, another ult that says you win the game, just probably not this turn. Alright, now with those cards being our win cons, what are we doing to keep the opponent from killing us, or to advance our game plan other than just win cons? Well, we start off with Collective Brutality. Now this is a four of, I'm experimenting with it. It might not be good enough in this Smuggler's Copter format, frankly. Ooh, that alliteration. But yes, being able to minus two, minus two, so disfigure something at sorcery speed, drain for two, or just take another card out of their hand, all of those seem like good modes, and we can escalate discard a card and get them back with Liliana the Last Hope or something else. I'll show you in just a minute. So that's okay. Next we have f uh, 4 Grasp of Darkness, minus 4, minus 4, deals with the Looter Scooter, deals with Kalitas, deals with a lot in this format actually, very simply. Next I have To the Slaughter, now this one is a 3 of, partially because it's not as good generally, it's CMC 3, and without Delirium, uh, it's not great, right? With Delirium, this gives us our only mainboard answer to Planeswalkers, aside from just beating Planeswalker face in, right? Whew, 
uh, but again, just not as efficient, and also making them sacrifice a, a creature isn't great in a format that doesn't have that much, much hexproof running around. Giving them the ability to choose the creature, not so much. Let's say, for instance, that the looter scooter is doing its thing. Why would they not just sacrifice the other creature? Okay, I guess if it's another creature like Kalitas and they just tapped it to get the scooter out that turn. Okay, but that's pretty much the one exception, right? Usually they want to keep the scooter around because that's harder for any deck, usually, to deal with. Next we have a 1 of Oath of Liliana. Essentially it's a 4th sorcery speed to the slaughter, but it also gives us zombies when one of our planeswalkers enters the battlefield. And since we have 4, I think that that's enough to merit a 1 of. It does work on its own, and it can do a little bit more later on. Notably, the zombies do not come in tapped, which means that they can defend you and your planeswalkers on that very turn. Next, and here's a card about which I am crazy right now. For two it is find. Nice little two for one. Choose one or both for three mana. Return an artifact from your graveyard to your hand. Return a creature from your graveyard to your hand. Now why would this be good in emerge decks? I wonder why. Yes, this always means that you'll be able to get both your enabler creature for emerge and the actual payoff creature. Seems good. Get both of them back, and then of course the advantage you get, let's say you get Fortuitous Find, I don't know, Filigree Familiar, Distended Mindbender, gain two life, draw a card, make them lose two cards, and you have a 5-5. Five five. This is where it's at, but it's only a two of because in the early game, this does exactly jack all. Not much. Not much at all. But with eight creatures that are artifacts, and let's see, ten creatures? That may not be quite enough that you're always going to get it, but we do have a little bit of card draw in the deck to try to get us in there. In addition to Obnixilis Reignited, we have Succumb to Temptation, just as a two of. You draw two cards and lose two life. More of that black hand advantage going on. Because there isn't much that we're doing, let's say that our opponent deals with an emerge creature, or deals with one of the enablers for it. It may take us a while to actually find a way out, and while it's true that we can stall the, the board, stall the opponent until then, it helps to be able to have some velocity to get ourselves out, because there's always that chance that the opponent draws more threats than we have answers to. Succumb to temptation as a two of, for that reason. Now, for our land base, we start off with something very simple, 15 swamps, easy enough, mono black, Saves us a lot of money by pretty much just having basics there. I say pretty much because we have eight exceptions. We have four Blighted Fins. Now, this does give you a land for Delirium, yes, of course. It also gives you something that can take care of Imrakul, because we can't run Stasis Snare. Hopefully, we'll be able to have enough lands out that we can play Blighted Fin against our Imrakul, or opponent's Imrakul. They'll still take our turn, but it won't be as bad, it won't be as consequential. But, unfortunately, with the exception of maybe to the slaughter, there's nothing else that we can really do against them. So, Blighted Fin, and then we have Sanctum of Ugin. Now, later on in the game, when we cast a colorless creature with CMC 7 or greater, sacrifice it to get another one, reveal it, and add it to our hand, then shuffle up. This is one of our ways to try to get out of a late-game uh, lull, or late-game late game slump, I suppose. If our opponent keeps dealing with our creatures, this gives us a way to get out. Just simply go sacrifice it, get another one, and say if you deal with this one, we'll have another one on the way. There's some smart play that's required. If they're a Fumigate deck, or a Planar Outburst deck, or a Descend Upon the Sinful deck, if they're playing Big White, Control, you know, save it. Keep the 6-4 beats for a little while. But, if you need to just beat down, cast both of them, you get the idea. Just a just a tip, just a trick. Now, for what we're doing in the sideboard, and by the way, that's 23 lands, so 37 non-lands. I think that that's okay. I think that that gives us a reasonable enough density of lands, win conditions, and enablers, and interaction with our opponent. That being the case, in the sideboard, if we need to add more win conditions, there's a number of ways that you can go about doing this. Noxious Gearhulk, for instance, is absolutely amazing. It's great, to be sure. 
I am trying out Demon of Dark Schemes. Flying 5-5. Five, five. When it enters, minus 2, minus 2 until end of turn to all creatures. That shouldn't ever really hurt us. The only creatures that would die to that in our deck are the creatures that are getting sacrificed for Emerge anyway. So that's not much of a downside for us, which is why I put this in instead of Noxious. And it's a little cheaper, I think. That being the case, feel free to disagree, especially since we aren't doing anything with energy in this deck, so Demon of Dark Schemes is going to have to get himself up au naturel. But if you can, then pay 3 mana for energy, get a creature from a graveyard, not just yours, a graveyard, onto the battlefield tapped, under your control. Nice little way to take over the late game. Keep dealing with all of their threats, right? And for every threat with which you deal, you get an energy. Whenever another creature dies, by the way, so this also means that when you sacrifice one of these for emerge, you get an energy. You get the idea. There's a lot going on there. Now, for dealing with their creatures, I actually have a whole lot. By the way, this is only a two of. We start off with four essence extraction. This could be murder as well. I like it because it also gives us three life, and I anticipate, maybe this is just my meta, there's still being a fair amount of burn running around. But if that's not the case, make this murder. That's an easy switch. Do it. Absolutely. Yeah, just three damage, you gain three life. Only works on creatures. Fair enough. But it doesn't deal with Kalitas, doesn't deal with Ishkana, doesn't deal with emerged creatures. It's just, it's a meta read, I'm telling you, you can change this one for Noxious, you can change this one for Murder. Next we have a one of Flaying Tendrils for the decks that like to go wide. If we're getting swarmed with, say, uh, vampires or uh, vehicles, I think sometimes we'll be low enough that we can deal with, not vehicles, uh, Boros Agro, there we go. Then yeah, this is certainly a way to deal with them. And yes, it exiles them. Maybe that doesn't matter all that much, but maybe it's hugely consequential. There's a lot of good graveyard interaction uh, in the format right now, with Delirium still running around and Kaladesh giving some new tools to decks. That may be all that you need. Now, we also run Ruinous Path as a 4 of. This is our Planeswalker interaction that also serves as a backup win condition and a sorcery speed creature removal. So, not against the Looter Scooter, but against a lot of other things. This also just gives us another way to deal with planeswalkers when our only mainboard answer is to the slaughter or just being their face. And then lastly, maybe not least, transgress the mind. Wouldn't be a black deck in this standard without transgress the mind in the main side or both, right? If you just need more hand attacks, say, against control decks, or actually now we have a number of combo decks running around in the format, including a Cheerios deck. And if you don't know what that is, that there was a time when a number of magic decks were named after cereals like uh, Cheerios, Fruity Pebbles, I think there was a Cocoa Pebbles as well, um, Oops All Spells after Oops All Berries. I'm sure there are more. Like if I just started naming random cereals, I wonder which ones people would actually think were decks. That was how crazy it got for a while. All right. So just four transgress the mines to deal with whatever we need later in the game. Not for the early, low to the ground aggro decks, but for later on. Uh, Planeswalkers deploy the Gatewatch decks. It's for Gear Hulks, you get the idea. Other Emerge decks. And this is what we have going on right now. Definitely budget. The lands are much cheaper, to be sure. Uh, the creatures themselves, these are two of the lesser played. Weirdly enough for Descended Mindbender, but it's one of the lesser played uh, Emerge creatures, and Abundant Maw way down there, to be sure. Down with, like, Mockery of Nature levels. Uh, Pilgrim's Eye, uncommon. Filigree Familiar, uncommon. Kalitas and Gonti aren't actually necessary in the deck, to be sure, but I'm trying them out. They just give you other game plans, potentially. And if you want to go for a tutor version of this deck, say with Diabolic Tutor, or one of the other ways that we have to go and get a certain card, Aetherworks Marvel, I guess, then, yeah, you can play them just as one-ofs to go out, and if you, if you need that kind of answer, then there you go. And then Liliana and Obnixus. Liliana is... 
the shit. She's good. She's really good. I was not convinced that she was even modern playable until she wrecked me in Junk, in Obzon, when I was playing Infect. I had everything ready, I knew they were playing Obzon, I kept the fetch land up to go for Dried Arbor for the Edict, and no, he plays the other Liliana. <laughs> and then I have no answer, I have, uh, I was caught off guard, caught with my trousers down. Alright, that's it, that's the deck. If you have any comments, any suggestions, any constructive criticisms, or any decks that are similar to this that you can link to me, feel more than free to leave them in the comments below. And if you have an idea for a deck tech, something you'd like to see me try out, feel more than free to let me know about that as well. In the meantime, Magic Community, I will see you later. T1 Glistener Elf signing off. Bye-bye. Woo!